Hello, welcome. Um, this is another episode of um, our Fluxana webinar Inside XF. My name is Susan Aschenbrenner, um, and we are having the topic of um, EDXRF versus WDXRF today. We will do some comparisons also based on samples. And um, it's, it's just something very interesting to see how these two methods um, complement each other and um, where which method is better or has some weaknesses. And this is what we are looking at today. First of all, we are dealing with X-ray fluorescence analysis, no matter which method we are using. Um, we are having some kind of a sample. We are doing some kind of sample preparation, whether we are having a powder making a pressed pellet or fusing a fuse bead, or if we are um, having some liquid or power directly put into a cup and then for measurement. Um, in the end, the sample will somehow be measured in an X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, and we will get some kind of result in form of um, element or oxide concentrations. And now there are two options um, for which we can opt when we purchase this kind of spectrometer, which is um, the ED system or the WD system. And this is like a common question, like which one should I, should I actually go for, for which method? Um, first of all, our aim is always the analysis of the sample. And secondary, we also want the best possible result, especially when it comes to precision and accuracy. And as always, we want to be time and cost efficient. But let's look at the general principle of XIF first. In this graph, you can see that the radiation of the X-ray tube is coming in and kicking out an electron of the inner shell. An electron from one of the outer shells will then replace this electron and then um, generate in doing so fluorescence radiation. This fluorescence radiation is then measured. So basically this is what we are, what we are seeing and depending on from which shell the, um, the electron is, um, the electron shell is filled up again. Um, there are um, fluorescence radiations with different um, energy levels coming in and those we can measure. And also depending on which atom we are talking about, which, um, which element, um, the, um, the fluorescence radiation is unique. So this is in general how we um, are able to measure different elements and distinguish between different elements just by having a look at the fluorescence radiation. What is the range that we can uh, measure with, with X-ray fluorescence analysis? Basically, something like a rule of thumb is that we can measure from a fluorine to uranium as the heaviest element. There are some very, very special options where you can also um, measure these lighter elements up to boron. But there we need to put a lot of effort in. So generally, I would say it starts like for most of the uh, most of the devices with fluorine, and uh, for some devices, um, it just starts with sodium or magnesium, depending on the configuration of your device. So we are looking at energy dispersive ED and wavelength dispersive XIF um, uh, devices today. And what we are looking at is first of all, the differences in structure. We are looking at strengths and weaknesses of both devices. And then we are having um, a look onto application examples with real samples and real measurements, just to make some comparison possible here. But let's first have a look um, on the setup and the structure of the different instruments. In EDXRF, you have stationary devices, which look like this benchtop device um, on top most of the time. Um, you have a very simplistic setup. 
there's the X-ray tube that um, emits radiation um, towards the sample. We are having a direct um, excitation of the sample here. The sample, um, the, the red fluorence radiation from the sample is then going to the detector and the detector is measuring all the signals that are coming from the sample at the same time. So we are here um, having a detector and a setup which uh, makes it possible to measure um, several elements at the same time. Also, we are able to filter the um, initial radiation coming from the tube. So we are having a filter changer with, with for example, two filters here. Um, and that gives us another possibility um, to, um, to alter our, um, our direct excitation here. And this is the, um, the setup that we are having in some of the energy dispersive XIF benchtop devices. The second way this can work is when we are having some polarizer um, in between the tube and the sample. Here we are having indirect excitation. The radiation from the X-ray tube is, fir is first going to, um, to a polarizer, also called target, and then from the target to the sample, and then it will um, then again go to the detector and then it will be uh, measured. Um, the thing with the target is that um, you, can, um, you can improve the um, background, um, the peak background ratio by using a target, especially in uh, light matrices. But you are obviously also um, losing a little bit of the X-ray power because it also has to go to the target being polarized, going to the sample and this, like this. Um, yeah, this is the second um, setup that is possible for EDXIF devices. A very nice option that, um, that is there for EDXIF devices is a handheld uh, option. Here we are having something that looks a little bit like a gun and um, that has um, some battery most of the time located somewhere in the handle and then the electronics. And then there's a small X-ray tube and a very small detector. And um, you can actually directly point onto the sample or the testing object. Um, this, is, um, this is very good when you're, for example, having testing objects that are, um, that are very large that you cannot fit into a sample holder. Or if you just want to use this on site, you cannot move the sample from the side where you need to measure it. For these kinds of applications, handheld EDXIF is used. Which parameters need to op be optimized uh, when we measure an EDXIF? First of all, we are having the line positions basically just where the lines um, of the, the, um, the different elements are located. Um, most of the manufacturers um, are using something called MCA calibration. MCA is for multi-channel analyzer. They, uh, most of the time you will have some kind of sample um, coming with your device so that you can calibrate it and that um, the device can then adjust the line positions correctly again. And then the second thing you can alter is the uh, tube voltage and the current. So basically the power of the, of, the, um, of the radiation that you're using. Then for um, direct excitation, so without target, you can choose um, which primary filter you want to use. For polarized excitation, so with target, you can um, opt for different targets. And then you can also opt on um, how you want um, to um, have your um, background, um, background um, decalculated from, from your spectrum. Um, in case of EDXRF, the intensity that you are measuring is calculated from the area below the peak that you are measuring. So this whole area below the peak um, is your measurement intensity. 
from which you then later derive your concentration. Wavelength dispersive XIF on the other side, we can see here that this part of the setup is basically the same as in EDXIF. Here we are having an X-ray tube. We are also having a filter changer with filters and we are also having the sample in some kind of sample holder. But then the whole detection part is completely different. So in this case, we are having a collimator with different sizes that we can opt for. We are having a crystal and the crystal then um, um, just uh, chooses one um, distinct wavelength. So one distinct element um, to, um, to be detected by the detector. So in this case, we are not measuring all the fluorescent signal that we are having at the same time but we are sequentially measuring line by line by line by line. So each element or each oxide we are looking at one by one. Which parameters we need to optimize when we're looking at um, WDXRF. Here we are having um, a line position as well, but in this case, um, it's by the, uh, um, by the famous two theta angle that, um, that uh, de defines um, at which point uh, the peak maximum of your distinct element is. So at this point, you will just do a scan for your WDXRF uh, measurement. You will define the maximum, see which uh, angle is uh, belonging to the maximum and then you set the line position in this case. Then you can set a background if, re uh, if required, but think about um, just if required, because it has additional measurement time. We are not measuring everything at the same time as in, um, in EDXRF, but we will have additional uh, measurement time for um, this part. Um, then we can obviously also change the tube uh, voltage and the current. We can also opt for a primary filter. And then we can also choose the size of the collimator. We can choose which crystal to use. Um, the detector can be chosen. Um, here it's uh, for crystal and detector. Sometimes the software gives some good hints um, uh, which one to use where, um, but um, also have a look like what fits where. Um, then you opt for the detection window and um, the intensity in the end is calculated not from the, um, from the area, but merely from the height of the peak. So you decide where's the peak maximum with your two theta angle. And then you, the uh, intensity will be just this height. If you are having any questions on these parameters, um, feel free to have a look. There is a, um, a webinar that was in July last year. It was method development creation of a WDXIF measuring program. So in this webinar, it was explained very nicely um, how to choose all these different uh, parts and what you have to look out for while doing so. So if you have the feeling you need some backup there, just have a look onto this webinar, it's for free and there's a recording available. So now we saw which device has which features and now we can um, compare both of them. So what we can say about the um, ED device is um, that we are having an, a high efficiency in measuring because we are measuring several elements at the same time. And we are very good with heavy metal analysis. So everything that is marked in orange here is very, very nicely done with the ED. For the, um, for the wavelength dispersive spectrometer, we are having a very high resolution and sensitivity. Um, in these devices, higher power tubes are built in. And also due to the fact 
that we are separating line from line from line from line, we are having a high resolution there. So we can really very, very well see light elements and also rare, rare earths. So this is the things where this device really shines, this one more for the heavy metal analysis, which doesn't mean that this one cannot do heavy metals or this one cannot do light elements at all. We will see that later. So let's uh, sum everything that we set up until now up a little bit. The EDXRF instruments are um, having an easy setup and they are small devices, while the WDXRF, they are most of the time large devices and have a complicated setup. There are, um, or more complicated setup, there are benchtop devices for, um, for the WDXRF, um, but those, also have a weaker tube power. So if you are uh, dealing with this kind um, of device, keep this in mind. Normally for these devices, we are having a stronger tube power here, while in the uh, benchtop device for also for ED, we are having a weaker tube power, which also means there's no extra cooling required here, while in the WDXRF, we require an extra cooling. The intensity, as I said before, for ED is calculated um, from the um, area um, below the peak. The um, intensity for WDXRF is calculated from uh, the intensity of the peak height. Um, for the EDXRF, there we have uh, simultaneous excitation and uh, measurement of several elements per measurement condition and unit of time. So very efficient here for WDXRF, we are measuring sequentially and we measure single elements one after another. So ED is especially powerful for heavy elements. WD has a high resolution and therefore is very powerful, especially for light elements. Let's have a look onto some real samples um, to see what this means. First of all, I want to show you some raw materials. These, um, this, these um, values are um, from a limestone sample. Um, we fused it to a fused bead using eight gram of flux and one gram of sample. We fused it with our Vitriox electric device and the calibration that's behind the values for both options is our raw application package. So you will always see the WD um, values uh, marked in green and the ED values marked in orange. And what we can see now is that um, we, um, we sorted the uh, measurement uh, values um, according to the atomic number here. So this is the very lightest element that we measured in this case, and this is the heaviest element that we measured in this case. What we can see now is that for magnesium, which is the lightest element, we see that in the mean value, we get somehow nice comparable values between the WD XIF measurement and the ED XIF measurement. But if we are looking at the standard deviation, so the scattering of values, we are uh, finding that for the, um, for the WDXRF, we are having a way lower standard deviation than for the ED device. So now here's the thing. If I say, okay, this is enough for me, we can still measure magnesium in the um, energy dispersive device. It works, it, it, it gives, it gives okay, okay values. It gives um, values that are in the correct range. And um, in, in this case, we are just having a way lower standard deviation. So we can still say, okay, that's enough for me. Um, if we move along the atomic numbers, so from the lightest to the heaviest element, we can see that the heavier the element um, gets, um, the smaller the difference between these two devices um, are. 
Uh, so at some point, you don't even really see a large difference between these two devices. So potassium or calcium, there's already somehow comparable standard deviations. So what we see, light elements, WDXIF gives really nice um, precision values as well. And um, at some point, it just doesn't matter anymore which kind of device I'm using. The same thing we can see for, um, for another sample, same preparation, same application package. It's a feldspar in this um, case. So we are having, in this case, a lot of sodium in the sample. And again, we see the mean value is, is okay for the ED measurement, but the standard deviation is way higher than for the WD um, values. And again, we see that um, the higher the atomic number, so the heavier the element, um, the, um, um, the more comparable these results are. And for strontium, we see that we are even a little bit better in the ED than in the WD. And then there's the last material that I want to show for this application. It's a cement. Um, here as well, we see sodium, magnesium, uh, way larger deviations for ED than for WD. But as more, as further we move along the periodic sy system, we are um, at some point um, in a comparable range. And for some elements, we are even a little bit better when we are looking at the ED values. Now we could say what's happening with phosphorus here. Um, okay, we see that this is a quite low concentration here for phosphorus in this sample. Um, the, um, we have to keep in mind that we are diluting as well quite, um, quite uh, high. So in this case, we are having a high dilution and, um, and we are just lacking the tube power to get the, um, the nice um, standard deviation, the nice precision value here. But still, I can say this is enough for me. So let's move on to some geological samples. This one, uh, one geological sample was prepared in two different preparation techniques. One suffused bead, eight, again, eight gram flux, one gram sample, this time prepared with vitriox gas. Um, and then also with pressed powder as pressed powder. So one grams of binder, four grams of sample with a Veniax press. And we then measured with our WD XIF device, 50 kilovolts, 50 milliamperes, um, a light elements crystal. These crystals have different names depending on, um, on which device you are using from which manufacturer. And we are having a rhodium tube in this device. So, what we can see, red line, fused bead, blue line, pressed powder. Here we can see, uh, first of all, the, the effect of the dilution um, on the intensity. We are having a way higher dilution for the fused bead. So our intensity is lower. And this is especially in this case for, um, for sodium, this makes a large difference. Um, but still we can see uh, sodium, we can distinguish it from magnesium, from aluminium, from silica. And um, you see that there's a lot of space between the peaks. So it's all, it has a very high resolution and it, um, it um, is a very nice distinguishable between these um, different elements that we are looking at. Doing the same thing on an ED spectrometer with 20 kilovolts and two milliampere palladium target. So we are having a target here and a tungsten tube. We can see that the um, spectrum looks a little bit different. We can still see the effect of the sample preparation here. So pressed powder giving um, more intensity just uh, due to the fact that it's a um, um, sm uh, smaller dilution factor here. And um, what we can see is that um, sodium is uh, merely visible anymore. 
and um, all the peaks um, are very close to each other compared to the thing that we just saw for the um, WDXIF. Now you can get very scared if you are having a um, EDXIF and you want to measure sodium, but don't worry about it. Um, we are having a tungsten tube in our device and we, our, our device um, has a configuration which makes it very good for the analysis of heavy elements. It's just because of the um, applications we bought this um, device for. So if you are having a configuration in an energy dispersive spectrometer that is more for the, um, for the lighter elements, then your spectrum might not look like this, but more like this. I thankfully got the spectrum um, of a different ED model than um, the one that we are having. And uh, in this case, you can see the sodium peak is there. It's distinguishable from the, from the rest of the peaks. And we see in general, the intensity is a little bit higher for these lighter elements. Now let's um, have a look onto the application or one of the applications that, um, that our ED with the tungsten tube is actually quite good for. Um, this is used autocatalyst samples. Um, we are taking the simple powder, put it in a cup with foil, four grams of sample. And um, what I did is I um, made 10 measurements on the uh, WD um, XRF and 10 measurements on our ED device. And what we can see here is for rhodium, palladium, and platinum that um, the measurement, the uh, standard deviations on the ED device are um, way smaller than on the WD device. And um, so in this case, this instrument really shines. What you have to keep in mind is that we are also having a rhodium tube here in this, uh, in this device that uh, we used there. Um, I'm quite sure that with a little bit of effort, um, we could also improve these values. We are just not doing it because we are having this method which works perfectly well. We, you could improve this a little bit, but this is already um, yeah, very good. So. Uh, you see that we are having a low standard deviation here, which also means that our limit of detection for this method is very low for these, um, for these elements. And then my last example um, is um, something that is um, very specific for WDXIF. Um, here we are having a fluorine infused bead. Um, as I said in one of my first uh, slides, uh, fluorine is uh, somehow the first um, element that we can really measure with, uh, with uh, WDXIF without putting a lot of extra effort. And, um, but here we are also, in comparison with having a very light element, we are having a very high dilution. So um, we are having a few speed. We are having again eight gram flux, one gram sample, and we are having the uh, Vitriox electric uh, fusion machine um, on which we fused it. And the application package, so the um, calibration that's um, behind this is um, raw plus fluorine. Um, and what you can see here is that uh, in this scan, um, the device can uh, distinguish very nicely between um, the different um, fluorine concentrations, um, even though we are having a very high dilution, a very um, light element, this, um, this works quite well with WDXIF. So let's sum this up a little bit. ED. ED is very efficient. We are measuring um, several elements at the same time. Um, we are very good with heavy metal analysts. We are uh, analysts. We are very powerful um, for for heavy elements, whereas um, the WDXRF really shines with uh, high resolution and sensitivity. We are having 
a very nice light element analysis and for rare earth oxides. Then we are having the ED as the more inexpensive uh, solution while the WDXRF is um, more cost intensive there. Um, we are having small devices um, for ED compared to large devices uh, for WD. Um, um, but we can also have benchtop devices for WDXRF, but then with weaker tubes. For ED, we are having handheld options, which we do not have for WDXRF. And then in the end, it all comes down to the analysis. So for the EDXRF, we are having a faster analysis of many elements at the same time. And for the WDXRF, this is just fast if we are having a small amount of elements because we have to measure every element one after another. So if we are then summing up a lot of measurement times, this can take quite a while if you are trying to analyze many elements with these kinds of devices. And now we are coming back to our very first slide and we can ask, okay, but now I need to make a decision. Will it be ED or will it be um, WD? So the questions you have to ask yourself is, first of all, which elements do I want to analyze? Then what is my tolerances? for these elements. So um, how precise do I need to be? Which sample preparation will I opt for? Because you saw that it makes a, um, a huge intensity difference um, depending on the dilution that you are using. And then obviously, as always, what is my budget um, to purchase these kinds of devices? And it's always a good idea to get some advice from the manufacturer. They know their devices and they know which configuration you will need for what you want to measure, send samples uh, in and, um, and see what is possible. And then you will make the right decision. So thank you for your attention. Um, I want to say that there is another webinar, upco upcoming webinar, which is Laboratory Routines and Organization. Um, there you will get um, an insight in our laboratory um, routines that we are using in the accredited testing laboratory in Fluxana and hope that you will get uh, some nice hints how to um, improve your daily work. This is on May 18th. Having a look on the time, I don't think that we are having a lot of time left for questions, but um, if there are any questions, I don't see them right now. Nope, I don't see any questions. If there are coming, upcoming questions, please feel free to um, send an email. I will answer questions um, also after the webinar and you can, um, you can um, send them in and I will just answer them. And also if, um, if there are any questions coming, um, coming in the F&A uh, section or into the chat now, I will also answer these uh, via email later. And yeah, I'm wishing all of you um, a very nice day and hope to see you next time.